Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The Mary Celeste, an American brigantine, set sail from New York Harbor on November 7, 1872, carrying a cargo of denatured alcohol and a crew of ten, including the captain's wife and young daughter. The journey was expected to take six weeks, but after battling rough seas and heavy storms for two weeks, the ship was found adrift and abandoned on December 5, 1872, between Portugal and the Azores Islands. When the crew of the De Gratia boarded the Mary Celeste, they were shocked to find the ship in near-perfect condition, with ample provisions and no signs of struggle. The crew's personal belongings were neatly stowed away, and the cargo was untouched. The only things missing were the ship's lifeboat, the crew, and the captain and his family. What happened to the crew of the Mary Celeste? Did they fall victim to pirates? sea monsters or even extraterrestrials? Or was there a more plausible explanation, such as a faulty chronometer, clogged pumps, and a desperate attempt to reach land? Tonight, we'll delve into the enduring mystery of the Mary Celeste and explore the theories and investigations that have attempted to solve this puzzling case over the past 150 years. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… On April 29, 2022, a female corrections officer snuck a convicted felon out of Lauderdale County Jail, kicking off an 11-day manhunt that would end in the prisoner's re-arrest and the death of the woman he loved and who broke him out. The Ark of the Covenant, a sacred chest believed to hold the original Ten Commandments, in the 1980s, Ron Wyatt claimed to have found this legendary relic beneath Jerusalem. Did he truly find it? We'll look at some of the theories that captivated believers and skeptics alike. A young girl's fishing trip turns into a tragic mystery when she vanishes without a trace. As the community searches for answers, a shocking confession leads to a murder trial that left many questioning the truth. The Beast of Gévaudan, a mysterious creature that terrorized a small French province in the 1760s with gruesome attacks. Believed by many to be an actual werewolf, it resulted in a frantic hunt for the monster. And even now, over two centuries later, the story still captivates us. But is there any truth to the tale? Frederick Fisher, an English shopkeeper, vanished in 1826 only to reappear as a ghost to help solve the mystery of his disappearance and death. The puzzling case of Sherry Papini's 2016 kidnapping shocked Northern California and led to years of speculation. After her sudden return and subsequent arrest in 2022 for faking the incident, many questions remain unanswered. But first, the Mary Celeste was discovered abandoned near the Azores Islands on December 5, 1872, and to this day, experts are unsure about what happened to its crew. We begin there. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness.
The open sea has always been a source of wonder, adventure, and mystery. Throughout history, countless ships have sailed across vast oceans, facing the challenges of nature and the unknown. Some of these ships have become legends, their stories passed down through generations. One such ship is the Mary Celeste, an American brigantine that was found abandoned in the Atlantic Ocean in 1872 with no sign of its crew. This is the story of the Mary Celeste and the enduring mystery that surrounds it. On November 7, 1872, the Mary Celeste set sail from New York Harbor bound for Genoa, Italy. The ship was loaded with a cargo of 1,701 barrels of denatured alcohol, a type of alcohol used for industrial purposes. The ship was commanded by Captain Benjamin Briggs, a 37-year-old experienced seaman from Massachusetts. Accompanying him were his wife Sarah and their two-year-old daughter Sophia. The crew consisted of seven experienced sailors, all of whom had good reputations. The journey was expected to take around six weeks, but the Mary Celeste encountered rough weather almost immediately after setting sail. For two weeks, the ship battled heavy storms and high seas as it made its way across the Atlantic towards the Azores Islands. Captain Briggs documented the difficult conditions in his journal, noting the challenges the ship and crew faced. Despite the harsh weather, the Mary Celeste remained on course, and by November 25, 1872, the island of Santa Maria was in sight. Captain Briggs made his final log entry at 5 a.m. that day, indicating that the ship had faced rough seas and strong winds the night before, but that everything seemed fine now. Little did he know that this would be his last entry in the ship's log. On December 5, 1872, the Canadian brigantine De Gracia was sailing through the Atlantic Ocean when it spotted a ship drifting aimlessly between Portugal and the Azores Islands. As the De Gracia approached, its crew realized that the ship was the Mary Celeste and that something was amiss. Captain David Morehouse of the De Gracia, a friend of Captain Briggs, sent a boarding party to investigate. What they found left them utterly puzzled. The Mary Celeste was in near-perfect condition, with ample provisions and no signs of struggle or violence. The crew's personal belongings were neatly stowed away, and the cargo of alcohol was untouched. The only things missing were the ship's lifeboat, the crew, and the captain and his family. The boarding party also noticed that the ship's chronometer, a vital navigational instrument, was not functioning properly. This meant that the Mary Celeste had been sailing off course for some time. Additionally, the ship's pumps had been disassembled, and there was a small amount of water in the bilge, the lowest part of the ship. The crew of the De Gracia decided to tow the Mary Celeste to Gibraltar, where a thorough investigation could be conducted. However, despite the efforts of the authorities, no conclusive evidence was found to explain the disappearance of the crew. The mystery of the Mary Celeste quickly captured the public's imagination, and numerous theories and speculations emerged to explain what might have happened. Some suggested that the crew had mutinied and killed the captain and his family, then escaped in the lifeboat. Others believed that pirates had raided the ship, murdered the crew, and stolen the lifeboat. More outlandish theories included attacks by sea monsters, giant squid, or even extraterrestrial abductions. Some even suggested that the crew had been taken by the Bermuda Triangle, despite the fact that the ship was nowhere near that region. One theory that gained traction was that of insurance fraud. Some speculated that Captain Briggs and Captain Morehouse had conspired to abandon the ship and split the insurance money. However, this theory was quickly debunked, as Captain Briggs had no motive to abandon his own ship, and there was no evidence of any such conspiracy. The mystery of the Mary Celeste even inspired fiction, most notably Arthur Conan Doyle's short story, J. Habakkuk Jeffson's Statement, published in 1884. While the story was fictional, it added to the intrigue surrounding the real-life event. In 2002, nearly 130 years after the Mary Celeste was discovered abandoned, documentarian Anne McGregor set out to solve the mystery once and for all. 
Using modern technology and a team of experts, McGregor conducted a thorough investigation into the case. One of the key findings of McGregor's investigation was that the Mary Celeste's chronometer was faulty, causing the ship to be significantly off course. This, combined with the evidence that the ship had changed course several days before the final log entry, suggested that Captain Briggs may have been seeking shelter from the bad weather. McGregor also discovered that the Mary Celeste had previously carried a cargo of coal and that coal dust may have clogged the ship's pumps, making it difficult to remove any water that entered the ship. This, coupled with the fact that the pumps had been disassembled when the ship was found, led McGregor to propose a new theory. According to McGregor, Captain Briggs, realizing that the ship was off course and that the pumps were not working properly, may have decided to abandon the ship and head for the nearest land, Santa Maria Island. The crew would have used the lifeboat to make their escape, but in the rough seas, the small boat may have capsized, causing all ten people on board to drown. While McGregor's theory is not universally accepted, it does provide a plausible explanation for many of the puzzling aspects of the case. It explains why the ship was found in good condition, why the crew's belongings were left behind, and why the lifeboat was missing. The mystery of the Mary Celeste has endured for over 150 years, and while numerous theories have been put forth to explain the disappearance of the crew, none have been conclusively proven. Whether the true fate of the Mary Celeste's crew will ever be known remains uncertain. But one thing is clear. The ship and its story will likely continue to intrigue us for years to come, as we all love a good mystery. Coming up, the puzzling case of Sherry Papini's 2016 kidnapping shocked Northern California and led to years of speculation. After her sudden return and subsequent arrest in 2022 for faking the incident, many questions remain unanswered. And Frederick Fisher, an English shopkeeper, vanished in 1826, only to reappear as a ghost to help solve the mystery of his disappearance and death. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. In 
in 2016, the kidnapping of Sherry Papini shocked Northern California. The terrifying story of her abduction in the Shasta County suburbs left people stunned. For three weeks, Sherry's family worked tirelessly to bring her back while the Shasta County Sheriff's Department quietly investigated. Then, out of nowhere, Sherry returned home. But she wasn't eager to share details about her ordeal. Because of this, many believed the whole thing was a fake kidnapping. In 2022, Sherry was arrested for faking her own kidnapping and received a prison sentence nearly six years after she claimed she was abducted. Here's everything we know about the mysterious disappearance, return, and arrest of Sherry Papini. On November 2, 2016, Sherry Papini was out jogging near her home in Redding, California when she was allegedly abducted. Her husband, Keith Papini, knew something was wrong when he returned home from work and Sherry wasn't there. After locating her phone using GPS, he found it, along with a pair of earbuds and some strands of her hair near the neighborhood's mailboxes, about a mile from their home. Initially, law enforcement suspected Keith might be involved in Sherry's disappearance. While Keith hasn't been entirely ruled out, he did pass a polygraph test, and law enforcement officials have said that he's been very cooperative since the investigation began. Immediately after Sherry disappeared, Keith grew dissatisfied with what he felt was a slow-moving case, so he started a GoFundMe page to help finance an independent investigation. The money was supposed to pay for two private investigators who Keith believed would work tirelessly to find his wife. Local law enforcement disapproved of this plan but continued their investigation. The GoFundMe page remained active for a year, even though Sherry was found three weeks after it was launched and it raised nearly $50,000. The Papini family never disclosed what they did with the money, despite concerns from donors. Cameron Gamble, a government security contractor, was one of many people who worked with the Papini family to help find Sherry. He believed Sherry had been taken by a sex trafficking ring traveling down Interstate 5 to Mexico. Gamble offered his services for free and acted as a liaison with an anonymous donor, much to the frustration of local law enforcement. Gamble made two commercials about Sherry's disappearance, leading some to believe he was using the case to advertise his skills as a hostage negotiator. An anonymous donor offered the Papini family an additional $50,000 to help bring Sherry back. Gamble and the donor believed offering money would make the kidnappers release Sherry. Shasta County Sheriff's Department Lt. Anthony Bertain was unhappy about the donor's involvement, fearing that offering a large sum of money would attract scam artists instead of bringing Sherry back. After the initial amount of ransom money went unclaimed, the anonymous donor released another YouTube video offering six figures to anyone who found the kidnappers. On Thanksgiving Day 2016, Sherry was pushed out of a car in Yolo County, 150 miles from her home, though no one ever came forward to claim the money. When Keith reunited with his wife in the hospital, he described her as covered in bruises ranging from yellow to black because of repeated beatings, and the bridge of her nose was broken. Additionally, Shasta County Sheriff Tom Basenko revealed that her skin was branded with a message, the meaning of which has not been explained. Sherry told a harrowing story. She claimed two Latina women had captured her while she was jogging and kept her blindfolded for the entire three weeks she was missing. In some accounts, she said they wore masks, which is why she never saw their faces. The Shasta County Sheriff's Department remained silent, but Gamble believed Sherry was taken by traffickers who tormented her to break her will. Following Sherry's return, the family became reclusive, avoiding the media. Neighbors noted that the Papinis holed up in their Shasta Lake home and were rarely seen. Many online sleuths questioned why the Shasta County Sheriff's Department's investigation seemed so slow. Police said they didn't release many details because they were investigating a link between Sherry's disappearance and that of another woman, Tara Smith, who vanished in 1998 under similar circumstances while jogging near Redding, California. Unlike Sherry, Tara was never found. Almost a year after Sherry returned, police discovered male DNA on the clothing she was wearing when she disappeared. 
Shasta County Sheriff's Office Sergeant Brian Jackson said the male DNA was compiled from the clothing Sherry was found wearing, and it was put into the CODIS DNA database in mid-2017. However, there have been no matches to known offenders. The male DNA contradicted Sherry's story that she was taken by two women. The DNA might have been on the clothing before it was given to Sherry. Sergeant Jackson said, hopefully down the road, once we get these females identified, we will get the answers for that. After revealing the male DNA, the police also discussed a man in Michigan with whom Sherry had been in contact before her disappearance. They were in an online-slash-texting relationship, but the police didn't state if it was romantic. The man had visited California from Michigan a few days before Sherry went missing, but he was not in Redding on the day she disappeared. This information supported the theory that Sherry might have been trying to start a new life. The media began leaking information about Sherry's alleged mental illness following her return. A transcript of a 911 call from Sherry's mother in 2003 revealed that Sherry had allegedly attempted to harm herself. Sherry's sister claimed that Sherry once kicked in her back door, and Sherry's father said she vandalized his home. While these stories don't prove that Sherry fabricated her kidnapping, they did further complicate the case. Police released sketches of the women Sherry claimed took her, but there were no distinguishing marks beyond one woman wearing large hoop earrings and the other having thick eyebrows. The police stated they no longer believed Sherry was taken by traffickers. Sergeant Jackson said, just on the facts that we know, it doesn't seem to be a sex trafficking or a sexual abduction in nature, and that's what we're trying to figure out. What was the purpose? He added that it is hard to keep somebody in captivity for 22 days. On March 3, 2022, nearly six years after Sherry's supposed kidnapping, police arrested her for allegedly faking the entire incident. She was charged with making false statements to a federal law enforcement officer and engaging in mail fraud, according to Rolling Stone. If convicted on both charges, Sherry would face a maximum of 25 years in prison and $500,000 in fines. In August 2020, authorities questioned Sherry again about the kidnapping, presenting evidence that contradicted her story. She stuck to her original account. Chris Thomas, a family spokesperson, criticized the dramatic nature of her arrest, stating that she would have complied with any police request quietly. He also said the charges were confusing and hoped for clarification. In October 2017, authorities discovered the male DNA on Sherry's clothing, leading them to her ex-boyfriend in Costa Mesa, California. The ex-boyfriend admitted he helped Sherry fake her kidnapping, saying she told him she needed to get away. He stated that Sherry stayed with him during her three-week disappearance and that she asked him to brand her with a wood-burning tool, which he did. On September 19, 2022, six months after her arrest, Sherry was sentenced to 18 months in prison. She was found guilty of mail fraud and lying to federal agents about her abduction, both occurring after she staged her disappearance. After her prison sentence, Sherry will have three years of supervised release. She'll also have to pay $309,902 in restitution to the California Victim Compensation Board, Social Security Administration, Shasta County Sheriff's Office, and the FBI. Sherry's attorney, William Poranora, said the sentencing was fair but noted that Sherry was a much different person now compared to when she faked her abduction in 2016. Poranora had previously called her 2016 plans a nonsensical fantasy. Ghost stories have fascinated people for centuries, transcending cultures and time. Despite advances in science and technology, the supernatural still captivates individuals from all backgrounds. Many ghost stories hold cultural and historical significance, rooted in local folklore, legends, and traditional beliefs. They reflect the values, fears, and customs of a community, helping preserve cultural heritage and creating a sense of collective identity. These tales also serve as cautionary lessons, warning against certain behaviors and teaching moral values. 
One of Australia's most famous ghost stories from the early 19th century is that of Frederick Fisher. Frederick Fisher was an English shopkeeper who got involved in a situation where he either unknowingly or intentionally acquired counterfeit banknotes through his business dealings. As a result, in 1815, Fred received a 14-year sentence of transportation to Australia. His reading and writing skills marked him as an educated individual, allowing him to redeem himself in Australia by acquiring multiple farms and plots of land. He also ventured into the papermaking industry. In 1822, Fred Fisher, having completed half his sentence, applied for a ticket of leave and permission to purchase property. Among other properties, Fred secured a farm in Campbelltown, which was a remote rural outpost at the time. In 1825, Fisher had an argument with a local carpenter and was sent to prison. Worried about his farm, Fisher entrusted his neighbor, George Worrall, with the responsibility of looking after it and gave him the power of attorney for the duration of his imprisonment. However, when Fisher returned from prison six months later, he found that Worrall had been claiming the farm as his own. On June 17, 1826, Fisher mysteriously disappeared. George Worrall announced he had sailed for England, and three weeks later he sold Fisher's horse and personal belongings, claiming Fred Fisher had sold them to him before he set sail. Four months after Fisher's disappearance, a local man named John Farley came forward with a peculiar story. Farley claimed that he had seen the ghost of Fred Fisher sitting on the rail of a nearby bridge. The ghostly figure did not speak, but simply gestured towards a paddock located beyond the creek before vanishing from sight. Initially, Farley's tale was dismissed, but the circumstances surrounding Fisher's disappearance eventually aroused enough suspicion for the police to search the paddock to which the ghost had pointed. Surprisingly, the remains of the murdered Fisher were discovered buried by the side of a creek. Based on circumstantial evidence, George Worrell was arrested and charged with Fred's murder. Although George initially denied the charge, he later confessed to the crime and was subsequently hanged. It's important to note that the story of Fisher's ghost didn't play a part in the conviction, as such evidence is inadmissible in court. Did Farley really see Fisher's ghost? Some suggest that Farley invented the ghost tale to conceal the actual source of his knowledge about the whereabouts of Fisher's body. Perhaps Farley witnessed the murder and saw the body being buried. He wanted to inform the authorities without implicating himself, so he invented the ghost story. Another theory is that the actual witness of the murder to protect himself disguised himself as the ghost and sat on the bridge waiting for a traveler. When Farley passed by, he pretended to be Fisher's ghost, moaned, and pointed to the burial site in the swamp. Yet another likely theory is that the ghost story was a hoax, a journalist invention by the Sydney-based magazine. Indeed, there is no mention of a ghost in the trial records of the case. According to the records, the body was discovered not because Fisher's ghost pointed at it, but because the police found several spots of blood on the fence that led them to search the area. The search was assisted by two Aboriginal trackers who reported traces they thought were the fat of a white man, presumably human tissue, floating on the creek. Proceeding further, they came to a spot which had been recently disturbed. Acting on intuition, they dug up the spot and discovered Fisher's body. Regardless of how the story of Fisher's ghost originated, it has since entered popular folklore. Every year in November, the town of Campbelltown holds the Festival of Fisher's Ghost to commemorate one of Australia's most famous ghosts. The creek beside which the body was discovered was named Fisher's Ghost Creek, although it has now been converted into mostly a stormwater drain. The story of Frederick Fisher and his ghost continues to be a significant part of Australian folklore. It reflects the fears and beliefs of the time and serves as a cautionary tale about trust and betrayal. Whether or not the ghost actually appeared, the tale has been passed down through generations, preserving a piece of cultural heritage and keeping the legend alive. When Weird Darkness Returns The Ark of the Covenant, a sacred chest believed to hold the original Ten Commandments, 
In the 1980s, Ron Wyatt claimed to have found this legendary relic beneath Jerusalem. Did he truly find it? We'll look at some of the theories that captivate believers and skeptics alike. Plus, a young girl's fishing trip turns into a tragic mystery when she vanishes without a trace. As the community searches for answers, a shocking confession leads to a murder trial that left many questioning the truth. But first, on April 29, 2022, a female corrections officer snuck a convicted felon out of Lauderdale County Jail, kicking off an 11-day manhunt that would end in the prisoner's rearrest and the death of the woman he loved and who broke him out. That story is up next. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. On April 29th, 2022, the nation's attention was captured by news of a manhunt for 38-year-old Casey White, a convict serving a 75-year sentence for a slew of felonies who had escaped from an Alabama detention center. But the most shocking detail, his partner in crime was a highly respected career corrections officer. Vicki White, no relation to Casey, had just turned in her retirement papers. April 29th was supposed to be her last day with the Lauderdale County Jail in Alabama. Instead, she helped Casey escape, and the pair went on a run together for 11 days. Casey was arrested, and Vicki shot herself. I never would have thought that in a million years, Lauderdale County District Attorney Chris Connolly told CNN. He said Vicki White was the most solid person at the jail. I would have trusted her with my life, he said. Vicki White had worked for the Lauderdale County Jail for nearly two decades. At the time of the escape, she was Lauderdale County's Assistant Director of Corrections, the second in command at the jail. She was a model employee, said Rick Singleton, the sheriff in Lauderdale County. All of her co-workers, all the employees in the sheriff's office, the judges, all had the utmost respect for her, he said. Some of the older prisoners looked up to her as a mother figure. Vicki had just turned in her retirement papers and talked about moving to the beach. No one ever suspected she would help a dangerous prisoner escape, let alone plan the whole thing. Vicki White was basically the mastermind behind the whole plan, according to Singleton. Casey White was behind bars. He really couldn't plan too much behind bars. Personally, I think she was the one to put the plan together, he said. But why would a highly respected and well-liked employee help someone like Casey White. According to Singleton, the pair had a special relationship. Vicky was giving Casey special privileges, and they carried on a romantic relationship outside of her work hours. This is not terribly unusual that you have this guard falling in love with a prisoner who's probably groomed her over a period of time, former FBI assistant director Chris Swecker said. Swecker believes Casey likely manipulated Vicky. He obviously needed her to escape, you would think someone with law enforcement experience, an assistant director of corrections in that county, would have thought a little bit farther down the road, Swecker said. She obviously lost all judgment over the last few months or so. Casey White was no stranger to the prison system. He had already spent three years in prison between 2012 and 2015 for beating his brother in the face and head with an axe handle. Within months of his release in 2015, Casey went on a crime spree involving a home invasion, carjacking, and a police chase. Casey was indicted on 15 felony charges and was eventually convicted on seven of those, including attempted murder and robbery. 
he was sentenced to 75 years in prison. Casey was serving out his sentence at the Donaldson Correctional Facility, a maximum security state prison, but in 2020 he confessed to the 2015 stabbing of Connie Ridgway in Lauderdale County. He was charged with two counts of capital murder and was taken to the Lauderdale County Jail for his arraignment, where he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. That's where he met Vicki White. After the arraignment, he was returned to the state prison, but he and Vicki kept in contact. According to WHNT, the pair exchanged 949 phone calls while Casey was at Donaldson. Casey returned to the Lauderdale County Jail on February 25th while he awaited trial for the murder of Connie Ridgway, to which he pleaded not guilty. In the weeks leading up to the escape, Vicki White sold her house for well under market value. She sold it for just over $95,000, and it was valued at $235,600. She also purchased a 2007 Ford Edge, one of several vehicles they used to flee. On April 29th, Vicki said she was taking Casey to the courthouse for a mental health evaluation, and then she would be going to the doctor because she wasn't feeling well. Vicki was able to take Casey by herself, even though jail policy stated someone with a record like Casey's needed to be escorted by at least two guards. She really exploited her good reputation at the jail, Connolly said, because you can have all the policies in the world. Yes, she broke them. She knew where to exploit them, too, using what she knew about those policies and her trustworthiness. Vicki was seen on surveillance cameras leading Casey in handcuffs and shackles out of the prison and into her patrol car, which was later found abandoned in a shopping center parking lot less than a mile from the prison. Prison officials found out later there was no evaluation scheduled for Casey that day, and Vicky never arrived at the doctor. The escape set off an 11-day manhunt for the pair. An arrest warrant was issued for Vicky White on May 2nd, and the governor announced a $5,000 reward for each of the pair. Both Casey White and Vicky White pose a major threat to the public and they must be apprehended. I am pleased to offer this support as law enforcement works diligently to get these dangerous criminals behind bars," said Governor Kay Ivey. On May 9th, the pair was spotted abandoning a car at a car wash in Evansville, Illinois. A chase ensued, involving U.S. Marshals, FBI agents, and Vanderburg County deputies. Law enforcement officials collided with Casey and Vicki White's car, causing it to overturn. After the crash, Vicki White shot herself, according to Vanderburg County Sheriff Dave Wedding. Casey White was apprehended and taken to the hospital with minor injuries. Vicki's friends and co-workers couldn't believe what she had done. At first, they thought she may have been coerced or forced to help Casey escape, but it became clear she had chosen to do it. Vicki White was a member of our family. That's why it was so hard in the first few days to grasp that she could actually do something like this because it was so out of character for her," Singleton said. In spite of what she's done, Vicky was a friend to every one of us. It has been an emotional roller coaster for our employees. Casey White was charged with first-degree escape and felony murder of the death of Vicky White. Casey pleaded guilty to the escape charges in exchange for dropping the felony murder charge. He was sentenced to life in prison in June 2023. I feel like the most hated man in the world. I loved Vicky, and I wouldn't drag her name through the mud for anyone in this courtroom, Casey White told the court. Vicky took me out because she said, right was right, wrong is wrong. First person to show me affection. First person to give me a hug in six years. The capital murder case against Casey for the murder of Connie Ridgway was also dropped. Connolly said there was no need to pursue the capital murder case since he was already spending the rest of his life in prison, and it would be a waste of state resources. Connolly also said the investigation into Ridgway's murder is still ongoing, and Ridgway's family supported not moving forward with the trial. The families of Connie Ridgway and Vicki White were in attendance for Casey White's sentencing. While they may not have justice for their deaths, they at least have closure. I trust that Casey White's behind bars and that's the main thing," said Austin Williams, Ridgway's son. We may not get justice in this life, but we'll get it in the next life. While we're here, we're going to keep fighting for it.
One of the greatest mysteries for believers of Judeo-Christian religions is the present location of the Ark of the Covenant, a chest said to contain the two stone tablets of the original Ten Commandments. According to ancient lore, gazing upon this sacred relic can bring serious consequences. Despite many theories about its location, in the 1980s one man claimed to have not only found the Ark of the Covenant, but to have seen it with his own eyes. The Bible says the commandments were kept by the Israelites in a wooden chest covered with gold, known as the Ark of the Covenant. This chest might also contain the rod of Aaron, which famously turned into a snake before the Pharaoh, and a pot of manna, believed to be the food provided by heaven for the Israelites while they wandered in the desert. One of the strongest claims to possessing the Ark of the Covenant comes from the Ethiopian Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion. They believe the Ark was brought to Axum by the son of the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon for safekeeping. Many other churches also claim to have the Ark. Possible locations include Jordan, Egypt, Israel, South Africa, France, Italy, Ireland, and the United States. On January 6, 1982, Ron Wyatt, an amateur researcher, adventurer, and Seventh-day Adventist, claimed he had found the Ark of the Covenant and the Ten Commandments buried under the remains of old Jerusalem. He believed the Ark was situated directly beneath the spot where Jesus of Nazareth was crucified, as foretold by prophecy. The Ark of the Covenant was supposedly kept in the Holy Temple, also known as Solomon's Temple, after the Israelites settled in the Promised Land. Six hundred years before Jesus' death, the Babylonians, led by Nebuchadnezzar, invaded and destroyed much of Jerusalem, including the Temple. It was then that the Ark of the Covenant became lost to history. During the Babylonian attack, they built a huge siege wall around the city so nobody could enter or leave. In response, the Israelites built many tunnels to move around the city without being seen. Many of these tunnels still exist today, and ancient artifacts have been found in them before. Wyatt argued that the Ark of the Covenant, the most sacred Jewish artifact, was hidden in an underground chamber, which was then sealed and forgotten. In 1901, a woman named Ellen G. White made the following prophecy. And he, Christ, gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tablets of testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. Nothing written on those tablets could be blotted out. The precious record of the law was placed in the Ark of the Testament and is still there, safely hidden from the human family. But in God's appointed time he will bring forth these tablets of stone to be a testimony to all the world against the disregard of his commandments and against the idolatrous worship of a counterfeit Sabbath. Students of the Bible, like Mr. Wyatt, believe that the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. Amos 3, verse 7. Miss White's prophecy, made 81 years before Wyatt's alleged discovery in 1982, was seen by Wyatt as a foretelling of the miraculous unearthing of the Ark of the Covenant. Ron Wyatt reported that the first find of the excavation was an altar stone protruding from the cliff face believed to be the remnants of an early Christian church, possibly from the first century AD. Wyatt said this suggested that the early Christians knew that this was a place of significance. Further exploration of the area revealed four holes cut out of the stone, believed to be the posts of the wooden crosses used for Roman crucifixions. The site where Jesus was crucified witnessed many other deaths, both before and after his. One hole was slightly more elevated than the others. This would be the location of the day's featured criminal, an honor most certainly given to Jesus on the day of his crucifixion beside two common robbers. A square-cut stone had been placed in the cross hole, acting as a plug. It had finger grips on each side, and when Ron Wyatt removed it, he noticed a large crack in the bedrock, extending from the cross hole. According to Wyatt, this was the exact spot Matthew spoke of when he said the rocks split with sorrow over Jesus' death. Wyatt and his team continued digging and eventually found a network of ancient caves. In one of these, he claimed to have discovered the Ark of the Covenant. He described his discovery in a 1999 interview with Anchor Stone International, made shortly before his death from cancer, saying, "...once we found that place, I knew that I needed to get inside that escarpment because there were several indications that it was just a system of tunnels and chambers. 
I needed to go chamber by chamber, tunnel by tunnel, until I found the Ark of the Covenant or until I didn't find it. We found it on January 6, 1982, at approximately 2 o'clock in the afternoon. When I found it, it was in a situation I had not anticipated or expected. It was in a chamber totally filled with what appeared to be debris. What turned out to be materials of furnishings of the first temple, covered first by animal skins, then boards, then stone, just whatever they could get their hands on. It looked like it had been done in a hurry. While examining the cavern, Wyatt noticed a strange black substance dried in a crack in the chamber's ceiling. The crack was situated right above the Ark of the Covenant, and it seemed like some of the black substance had even dripped onto the chest's outer stone casing. When Christ died, the earth quaked, the rock split right below his cross, and this crevice extended right down into the hidden chamber which contained the undefiled, earthly thrones of God, the Ark with its mercy seat," wrote Wyatt in one of his research letters. After he was dead, when the centurion struck his spear into Christ's side and pierced his spleen, the blood and water came out, falling down through that crack and was sprinkled on the mercy seat. If this was true, the act of dripping blood and water onto the Ark of the Covenant would have paralleled the blood and water sprinkled onto the commandments by Moses to sanctify God's covenant with the Israelites. Wyatt claimed that divine interference prevented any of the pictures or videos he took of the Ark of the Covenant from showing. Upon returning to the site to gather further evidence, it is said that four angels stood before him and he was told that the time is not yet for the world to see this discovery with their own eyes, but the time is coming when the inhabitants of the world will have a universal religious law enforced upon them. The Ark of the Covenant is not the only startling discovery that Ron Wyatt claimed to have made. Among more than a hundred biblical-related discoveries, Wyatt said he found Noah's Ark, anchor stones used by Noah, his post-flood house, tombs of Noah and his wife, the Tower of Babel site, the site of the crucifixion of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus in an earthquake crack, which he said had 24 chromosomes instead of 46. His discoveries have been dismissed by scientists, historians, biblical scholars, other creationists, and by leaders in his own Seventh-day Adventist church. Nevertheless, his work continues to have a following and has been preserved by Wyatt Archaeological Research. The disappearance of a loved one is a nightmare that no family should ever have to endure. For the Kellenhofer family, this nightmare became a reality on April 16, 1960, when 17-year-old Anna Kellenhofer vanished while on a fishing trip in Middle Tennessee. Her disappearance and the subsequent event that unfolded left a lasting impact on the community and raised many questions that remain unanswered to this day. On that mild spring day, Anna decided to go fishing at the Duck River, a popular spot for anglers in the area. She had planned to go with her brother, but when their car wouldn't start, she decided to make the four-mile trek to the river on her own. With a fishing rod in hand and a can of worms for bait, the shy country girl set off, hoping to catch some bass, perch, catfish, or even a rainbow trout. However, her real motive, as she had told friends, was to get a suntan. Anna's family became worried when she didn't return home later that afternoon. Her mother reported her missing, and three residents who knew Anna came forward, saying they had seen her walking toward the river, wearing red shorts and carrying a rod and reel. This was the last known sighting of Anna before she disappeared without a trace. As soon as Anna was reported missing, a massive search effort was launched. The Nashville Tennessean reported, Searchers beat through miles of rugged backwoods near here yesterday without finding a trace of a pretty blonde teenage girl who vanished Wednesday. More than 50 people, including National Guardsmen, searched on the ground and from the air. They checked an empty house at Devil's Backbone, a ridge along the Duck River, and a burned house in a small field spotted by a Civil Air Patrol plane. Coffee County Sheriff Dan Daniel was perplexed by the case, stating, "...you can't help but think there was foul play." You look at it any way you want, and you come up with the same thing. The Tennessee Bureau of Criminal Identification joined the search, but despite their efforts, no trace of Anna was found. The area where Anna had been walking was sparsely populated, 
with only a few scattered houses along the road. As the road neared the river, the terrain became more heavily forested, with craggy outcrops appearing. Friends described Anna as someone who seemed happy one day and depressed the next, which they attributed to normal teenage moodiness. She'd recently broken up with her boyfriend and decided to quit school. Two days into the search, a man named Fred Hickerson came forward with a crucial piece of information. He told police that Arthur Roger Ivey, a local insurance salesman, had given him a rod and reel, the same one Anna had been carrying. Ivy had apparently tried to sell it at a pawn shop for $2, but was unsuccessful. The police quickly brought Ivy in for questioning, and he soon confessed to his involvement in Anna's disappearance. According to the Tennessean, Ivy said he hit the girl accidentally, then panicked, piled her body into the trunk of his car, and drove to the old military reservation. He led investigators to Camp Forest, an abandoned World War II military base where he had buried Anna in a shallow grave covering her body with brush and trash. Despite Ivy's confession, some aspects of his story didn't add up. When investigators went to the location where Ivy claimed to have hit Anna with his car, they found no skid marks or disturbances on or near the road. Additionally, there was no damage to Ivy's vehicle. Dr. W. J. Core, who performed the autopsy on Anna's body, determined that she had died from a fractured skull caused by repeated blows to the head with a heavy, jagged instrument. He also noted brush and thorn marks on her legs, indicating that she'd been running through heavy brush just prior to her death. Due to decomposition, Dr. Kaur could not determine if Anna had been sexually assaulted. At Ivy's trial, Special Prosecutor Walter Pete Haynes told the jury that only two people knew for sure what had happened to Anna, Ivy and Anna herself, who now sleeps in the silent city of the dead. The prosecution theorized that Ivy had seen Anna walking toward the Duck River and offered her a ride, which she accepted. They believed he then drove her to Camp Forest where he likely made sexual advances toward her. When she resisted, he chased her through the woods and struck her with a tire iron or a rock, killing her before hastily burying her body. The jury convicted Ivy of first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to 99 years in prison. However, in 1963, the state Supreme Court overturned the conviction, ruling that the judge had allowed improper testimony about Ivy's moral character. In the second trial, Ivy's attorneys successfully argued that he had accidentally hit Anna with his car and hidden her body in a panic. This time, he was convicted of involuntary manslaughter and sentenced to one to five years in prison. Ivy was released in 1966 and died in 2001, a free man. The tragic story of Anna Kelnhofer's disappearance and murder continues to haunt the Middle Tennessee community. While the case was officially closed with Ivy's conviction, many questions remain unanswered. Did Ivy really kill Anna by accident, or was there more to the story? The truth may never be fully known. Up next, The Beast of Gavudan a mysterious creature that terrorized a small French province in the 1760s with gruesome attacks. Believed by many to be an actual werewolf, it resulted in a frantic hunt for the monster. And even now, over two centuries later, the story still captivates us. But is there any truth to the tale? While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Terror began in January by the light of the full moon. The first scream came from the snowbound railway man who felt the werewolf's fangs ripping at his throat. The next month, there was a scream of ecstatic agony from the woman attacked in her cozy bedroom. Now, scenes of unbelievable horror unfold each time the full moon shines on the isolated main town of Tarker's Mills. 
No one knows who will be attacked next, but one thing is sure. When the full moon rises, a paralyzing fear sweeps through Tarker's mills, for snarls that sound like human words can be heard whining through the wind, and all around are the footprints of a monster whose hunger cannot be sated. Cycle of the Werewolf by Stephen King Hear the entire novel absolutely free on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. For centuries, stories of werewolves have haunted Europe, and these tales go back even further in world mythology. But no story is as terrifyingly real as that of the Beast of Gévaudan. The Beast of Gévaudan was an animal that attacked humans between June 30, 1764 and June 19, 1767. These attacks, mostly fatal, ranged from 88 to 124 according to different sources and took place mainly in the northern part of Gévaudan, now called Lozère in France. This area was known for breeding livestock, making the attacks even more shocking. The number of victims varies by source. A 1987 study estimated there had been 210 attacks, resulting in 113 deaths and 49 injuries, 98 of the victims were partly eaten. Other sources claim the animal or animals killed between 60 and 100 adults and children and injured more than 30. The creature, which has never been fully identified, began a campaign of terror on the people of Gévaudan, a small province in southern France. The mysterious and gruesome killings became the deadliest series of wolf attacks in the history of the country. The attacks created mass hysteria and eventually caught the attention of the highest levels of government, even the king himself. The first reported attack by the beast took place in 1764. A young woman was tending to her livestock when the creature attacked. It made several attempts before being driven away by the cattle she was watching. She said the creature looked like a large, wolf-like animal with reddish fur, small ears, a dog-like head, and a long tail. The attack seemed like a one-time event. Until a few days later, when 14-year-old Jane Boulet was killed by the beast near the site of the first attack. All that was found at the scene were her bonnet and clogs. Boulet's body had vanished, devoured by the beast. Throughout the summer, attacks continued, mostly targeting lone men, women, and children working in the countryside. Villagers felt a growing sense of dread about what lurked in the wilderness around their homes. They began to arm themselves and wage war on the local wolf population, hoping to end the carnage. The brutal nature of the attacks was terrifying. Several reports indicated the head and neck of the victims were often the most damaged parts of the body, suggesting that the beast targeted these regions with unsettling intelligence and purpose. People began to wonder if the beast hunted for pleasure rather than hunger. The frequency of the attacks increased during the winter of 1764. As public hysteria grew, some believed it was a werewolf, a half-man, half-beast that preyed upon them. Others thought the creature was an oversized wolf or perhaps a pack of wolves. The Beast of Gévaudan quickly became more than just news, mobilizing royal troops and sparking all kinds of rumors. Some people saw the beast as a wolf or an exotic animal, while others believed it was a werewolf or even a serial killer. The reasons for its attacks ranged from divine punishment to theories of an animal trained to kill. King Louis XV became aware of the attacks after Jacques Portefeuille and a group of armed men survived an attack from the beast and reported it to the government. The king, horrified by the stories, awarded the survivors several hundred livres and offered Porte a fully funded state of education. He then announced that the government would personally see to it that the beast was hunted down and killed. True to his word, the king sent two professional wolf hunters to the region in February 1765 to track down and kill the beast. They believed the animal to be a Eurasian gray wolf and set out to capture it. 
After several months of hunting and hundreds of wolves killed, reports of attacks still continued. In June of that year, the professional hunters were replaced by Francois Antoine, the king's own lieutenant of the hunt. Antoine killed several wolves during his hunt, culminating in the capture and killing of three large gray wolves in the fall of 1765. The largest wolf, weighing 130 pounds and measuring over five and a half feet long, was thought to be the beast. Antoine returned to the king and received several titles and monetary awards for his services. The wolf was stuffed and displayed in the royal court, and life for the people of Gebudan returned to normal. However, just three months later, the attacks began once more. The beast, it seemed, had returned to continue its bloody rampage. The creature continued killing well into 1767 until local innkeeper Jean Chastel and a party of over 300 hunters finally tracked it down. Rumors later spread that Chastel used a silver bullet to end the beast's reign of terror, giving rise to the famous legend. Most eyewitness accounts agree that the creature was some type of wolf, though they all claimed it was far larger than any normal wolf. Some even said it was as large as a small horse. It was also said that the animal's skin was so tough it was resistant to bullets, contributing to modern-day beliefs about werewolves and silver bullets. During the three years, over 100 attacks were attributed to the beast, with other estimates claiming close to 200 victims. Several victims were reported to have been partially eaten, and when the creature killed by Chastel was examined, human remains were found in its stomach. Historians, scientists, and conspiracy theorists have all proposed theories about what the beast was. Among the suspects are a Eurasian wolf, an armored war dog, a striped hyena, a lion, some kind of prehistoric predator, a werewolf, a dog-wolf hybrid, and a human. Of the candidates, the most fanciful is the werewolf. The idea of an extinct prehistoric predator such as a bear dog, dire wolf, or hynodon is also unrealistic. The notion that such a large animal could evade detection for thousands or millions of years is implausible. Others have suggested that a human serial killer may be responsible for the attacks. Many of the beast's victims were reported to be decapitated, something few animals could do. While it is unlikely that a killer would roam around in daylight wearing a beast costume, those who support this theory believe that the human killer used an animal to carry out the crimes. Some have speculated that it was an armored war dog, explaining its strange appearance and why it shrugged off musket shots. Karl Hans Taki, a biologist and author of The Gevudan Tragedy, The Disastrous Campaign of a Deported Beast, argues the beast may have been an immature male lion. Like the hyena, it is possible that a lion escaped from captivity. The beast was reportedly an ambush hunter that seized prey by the neck and could possibly decapitate a victim. A lion, Taki argues, could exhibit these predatory behaviors. Among the most credible theories is that wolves perpetrated the attacks. As some experts suggest, Gevudan had a serious wolf infestation. They believe that large, lone wolves were attacking individual communities across the region or that it was a wolf pack. Wolves are native to the region and had attacked humans before. Some statistics show that wolves attacked humans 9,000 times in France between the 17th and 19th centuries. In most cases, these types of attacks were by rabid wolves. There are some potential flaws to the wolf theory, including the frequency of the beast's deadly attacks, suggesting it was not a single rabid wolf. Also, none of its victims seemed to have contracted rabies, indicating that their attacker did not carry rabies. Although many theories exist about the identity of the Beast of Gevudan, I'll admit that the truth will never be fully known. Now, almost 250 years later, the Beast has become a famous figure in werewolf lore. It made its literary debut in Gothic novels like La Bête de Gevudan and Wolves an Old Story Retold. Since then, it has been featured in contemporary media such as the feature film Brotherhood of the Wolf and the TV drama Teen Wolf. There is even a local museum in Sogay, France dedicated to the story of the Beast of Gevudan, retelling the legend for future generations.
Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Galatians 6 verse 9 Let us not become wary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And a final thought. We model God's grace when we refuse to hold grudges against those who hurt us. After all, God did that for us. Chuck Swindoll I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey Weirdos! Now through June 20th, everything in the Weird Darkness store is up to 35% off. That means huge savings on everything in the store, with t-shirts only 16 bucks. And now, long last, we have hats. Trucker hats and dad hats are now available in the store. And those are on sale too. Start shopping at WeirdDarkness.com slash store and then click on All Designs to see the full list of designs and products. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash store, then click on All Designs. Remember, the sale ends June 20th. WeirdDarkness.com slash store, and then click on All Designs. Hey Weirdos! Our next Weirdo Watch Party is this coming Friday, June 21st. Let nothing stop you. And this time it's a double feature. What a terrible thing. This Friday, Bobby Gamonster presents The Vampire's Ghost from 1954, where a bar owner who is a vampire is tired of living as a vampire. Vampire. And will also be treated to 1961's The Snake Woman, in which a doctor tries to cure his wife's sick mind by injecting her with snake venom, and she gives birth to a very creepy daughter. But that's not possible. That's why it's a horror movie. The fun starts early at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Watch one movie, then don't move a muscle. Stay for the second movie. It's a Weirdo Watch Party double feature. You're one of the nicest people I've ever known. Well, thank you very much. Our Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch online, so grab your popcorn, candy, and soda and jump into the fun and even get involved in the live chat as we watch the show. You will never speak of this. Never. No, actually, you need to tell everyone about this. It's a lot of fun. It's The Vampire's Ghost and The Snake Woman double feature brought to us by horror host Bobby Gamonster. You're seeing a creature that doesn't exist. Oh, he, he totally exists. I've seen him before. And he's a lot of fun. So join us on the Monster Channel page this Friday, June 21st at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll see you then.